So our last vertebra group are the synapsids. Uh, this is the mammals, uh, including monotremes, metatherians, and eutherians. Uh, this is uh, certainly the maybe the most important group for us, being that we are synapsids. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting group because uh, we think of them as being you know, the most advanced, and I've got certainly lots of very unique characteristics that are highly specialized, but uh, if you look at them in a sort of a success uh, uh, through evolutionary time sort of strategy, uh, it's really a relatively small group, you know, just a, you know, a little over 5,000 species. Uh, when you compare this to the birds, you know, 10,000 species, reptiles, 9,000 species, uh, you know, in terms of you know, diversity uh, and evolutionary success, uh, there are other groups that are um, maybe you know, more successful, if I could put that in air quotes, uh, than synapsids. However, uh, synapsids uh, have been able to essentially diversify in some you know, pretty extreme ways. Uh, and have adapted to essentially occupy every niche available to them on this planet, uh, and it's uh, you know it's rare that you see the ex uh, the extremes uh, as extreme as they are in mammals. You know every other group comparatively is you know, relatively constrained, uh, and you know, just imagine like uh, everything from the whale, the the largest animal ever on this planet, is in the same group as the bat, like a, a tiny flying mammal. So a uh, really neat, wide-ranging group. Uh, to thoroughly cover uh, synapsids, I uh, divided this lecture into three parts, really. Uh, there's going to be this introductory lecture, uh, and then there's going to be a, a class component, an in-class component, uh, and then there's going to be a follow-up lecture that's going to go through some of the characteristics uh, that we didn't uh, yet get to. So, sort of like a flipped lecture, but uh, maybe a little more fragmented. So, um, with that, uh, let's get into uh, synapsids. In this lecture, we're going to you know, briefly go over synapsids, you know, what, what they are, what are their key characteristics, go through a little bit of the phylogenetic tree for synapsids, just as an introduction to the, the group. Uh, and then we're going to get into mammals. And uh, I'll tell you about the uh, ancestral mammals. There's three of them that are fairly important. Uh, then we'll get into some of the key mammal characteristics uh, related to their skeleton and their inner ear, uh, the intuitment, so the hair glands, etc. cetera. Um, briefly go over circulation and ventilation. This is stuff everybody probably already knows fairly well. Uh, and then uh, get into the reproduction uh, re reproductive strategies and development because it's a fairly important piece of what mammals are. And then that'll lead us naturally into the three major groups of, uh, of mammals, monotremes, metatherians, and eutherians. All right, so here's the phylogen phylogenetic tree of synapsids. And uh, uh, first, uh, remember that synapsids uh, are being distinguished from sauropsids. So we spent the last couple of lectures talking about sauropsids, the birds, the crocodiles, amphibians, reptiles. Uh, what all those creatures have is uh, a, a diapsid skull. They have two uh, temporal openings in their skull. Synapsids only have one. Uh, now, synapsids uh, are, again, broadly divided into a couple groups mainly the mammals, which we'll get into in a second, and then mammal-like reptiles. Mammal-like reptiles is kind of a bad name because none of them are actually reptiles, so that can be very confusing. Uh, so typically what we say today are uh, these are non-mammal uh, synapsids. And there's, in the non-mammal synapsid group, there's behelkosaurs and then therapsids. Uh, we're not going to get into them too much because we don't, really need to know them because they're all extinct. Uh, mammals though have uh, many of the character well, have the, many of the characteristics that defined these mammal-like reptiles. So they have the lower temporal opening. They've taken on a more upright posture with their legs more underneath them, less sprawling like you'd what you'd see in a, an amphibian or a lizard. Um, they have a 
uh, more derived jaw structure, um, and we'll, which we'll get into in a minute. Uh, and then they have uh, tribosphenic molars, which is really what divides monotremes from the therians. Uh, and we'll get into that more in a future slide as well. So, but what I want you to take from this slide uh, is uh, that the um, synapsids are divided from sauropsids by this low, lower temporal opening. And there's several groups that are now extinct. Uh, what we're only talking about today are the mammals. All right, so here are the synapomorphies for synapsids. Um, they have what's called a dentary. Essentially, their lower, the bones in the lower jaw have been fused, where reptiles, essentially their lower jaw is a series of about seven bones. Here they've all been fused together into one. Uh, synapsids also have a single temporal opening. Uh, this is more obvious in the more ancestral state. Um, more derived mammals, this uh, opening has basically been pushed down and out and has become the zygomatic arch. Uh, synapsids also have differentiated teeth, so you know, they'll have like incisors for cutting, they'll have uh, canines for like grabbing and ripping, and then uh, more derived mammals will also have uh, like um, these molars for grinding and masticating their food. Uh, and then the last uh, characteristic of synapsids is this uh, cal calcaneal heel. Basically, they, especially on their hind feet, they have a, a heel bone, which is where the Achilles tendon inserts. Uh, so those are the major synapomorphies of synapsids. While mammals are you know, very diverse, uh, there are several character characteristics that are pretty much universal for all mammals. Uh, and you know, some of these have been secondarily lost, but uh, here are the key ones. Uh, so uh, all mammals have uh, an enlarged brain and uh, several skull features that go along with that. Uh, they have a three-part inner ear, um, partly der derived from uh, their lower jaw. Um, they have a dentary squamosal jaw joint, which basically is this ball and socket joint. Uh, and then post canine teeth with derived roots. Uh, so th these are the premolars and the molars. Uh, those characteristics we're going to discuss more in class. Uh, and it'll be a lot easier because you'll be actually holding mammal skulls in your hand and you'll be able to see many of these features. Uh, but mammals have a couple other characteristics that are important, uh, like hair, uh, like mammary glands, uh, they have a diaphragm and four-chambered heart, uh, there's endothermy, uh, they're pretty much all endothermic. Uh, they have enhanced olfactory senses uh, and vivipatry, most, with, with one exception, one group, the monotremes, all give birth to live young, and uh, sex determination is genetic, where the females have XX chromosomes and the males have XY. All right, so here are the three ancestral mammals that you, you should know about. Uh, the first one is uh, Morganicodon. This is from about 205 million years ago. Uh, it was a small, very mouse-like mammal. It had, it's really the first time uh, where we see an animal with that ball and socket joint that uh, defines part of one of the characteristics that defines mammals. Uh, then there was the Megazostradon, and uh, they were about 200 million, 200 million years ago. This was a, a shrew-like animal, um, similar, very similar to the Morganic Dawn. Uh, and then the other pretty key one is the Sinocodon, and uh, this one was found in China. It dates back to about 193 million years ago, uh, and it has that ball and socket joint in the jaw. Um, it also has the dentary, where the lower jaw is completely fused. Uh, what these three mammals represent uh, is basically the the first appearance of something that has the most, if not necessarily all, but most of the synapomorphies that define mammals. Uh, 
Moving on from uh, the ancestral mammals, let's start thinking about what is it that actually makes a mammal a mammal. Uh, there's quite a few uh, skeletal, skeletal structures uh, that tell us what a mammal is. Uh, let's go through a couple of them. Certainly this is not an exhaustive list. Um, we're going to cover teeth and skull structures uh, pretty exhaustively in class, so I'm going to go over them very superficially here. Uh, first, there's the dentary and the squamos squamosal jaw joint. This is that ball and socket joint. Dentary is the lower jaw, where it connects with the, the skull is the squamosal. Uh, that's a unique uh, derived characteristic of mammals. Uh, the post-orbital bar has been lost, so um, the bone that sort of divided the eye socket from the temporal fenestra has been lost. So it's basically the, where the eye is is joined with te that temporal fenestra. Um, the, uh, there used to be ribs on the cervical vertebrae, so these are the vertebrae you know, behind the head running towards the body. Uh, those ribs have been lost. Uh, and then uh, the last, well, no, not the last, one of the next things to know is the teeth. Uh, mammals typically have two sets of teeth. The first set are called milk teeth, and then the second set are their adult teeth. These teeth are typically double-rooted uh, in the jaw, especially the molars. Um, I should also point out that most mammals, and there's, there are two exceptions, but most mammals have five cervical vertebrae. Um, and uh, behind the head, uh, there are two that have been fused, and uh, they basically provide uh, better, strangely, like two fused vertebrae provide better mobility and allow mammals to move their heads not only up and down, but uh, side to side. Um, there's a variety of tooth morphology, but uh, basically we'll go through this in class and we'll show you how uh, the teeth have become, uh, especially the molars, have become uh, basically more varied, have more texture to allow for better grinding. Uh, and then the last part uh, has to do with the mammalian uh, middle ear, where um, uh, a reptilian uh, middle ear was essentially like a single bone that connected the eardrum to the tympanum. Uh, that's not the case in mammals. Uh, in mammals, uh, there are three bones, that, uh, otherwise known as the ossicles, that uh, perform this function. And um, the, these ossicles the, the malleus, the incus, and the staples essentially are um, bones that in a reptilian skull would have been part of the, the jaw and uh, the skull uh, have are no longer necessary in the mammalian jaw because the, the dentary is formed. So all the dentary in a reptilian skull had seven bones in a mammal skull five of those seven bones have been fused together. Uh, the remaining bones, not being needed for that purpose anymore, have uh, basically been repurposed to aid in detecting sound. Um, and the consequence is that with these, these three bone structures in the middle ear, um, mammals can hear a wider range and they're more sensitive to sound in general. So Mammals typically hear better than their reptilian um, ancestors. Uh, so I'm going to stop there with the skeletal structures, but we will cover most of this in more detail in class. Another place where there's been some really neat ad adaptations in mammals uh, is the entugement. So the skin, uh, including hair, uh, the glands associated with the skin, um, and in the next slide we'll get into you know, scales and horns and claws and hooves and stuff. Um, 
mammalian skin has you know, three layers. There's the outer layer, the epidermis. Then there's the, the dermis. Uh, and then below that is the hypodermis, uh, which is where the you know, subcutaneous fat uh, and like blood vessels and things run. Um, mammalian skin uh, is composed, and, and hair in particular, is composed of alpha carotene. Uh, the outer layers are non-living, and um, the number of you know, dead uh, epithelial cells uh, varies quite widely in mammals. You know, some only have a couple cell layers thick, while others, like you know, elephants or rhinoceroses, have like hundreds of dead cell layers you know, protecting and guarding the body. Um, the hairs are also, you know, non-living, and uh, the hair can provide a, a variety of services. Uh, it can be insulation, it can be camouflage, hair can be, like, uh, raised and be used in communication, and it can also act, to a certain degree, as uh, a layer of protection. Uh, hair can be uh, lost uh, through molting and then regrown, uh, and most hair will grow continuously. Some hairs are also used for sensation via uh, vibrisse, uh, which is just a fancy word for whiskers. Um, in the skin, there's also a variety of you know, nerve cells, like free nerve endings, uh, that can detect uh, pressure and pain. There's also heat receptors and cold receptors. Um, there's and then there's a wide variety of glands, and uh, these glands are pretty important. Uh, first, are the eccrine glands. Uh, for most uh, mammals, we find these glands mostly in the hands and the feet. Um, however, in primates, we have them everywhere. And they're pretty important for thermoregulation. Basically, these are the like the sweat glands. Uh, and the importance of the eccrine gland for primates is subtle, but maybe you know, surprisingly important. Uh, we don't have a lot of hardware for hunting. We don't have great claws. We don't have you know, ginormous teeth. Um, yet, uh, yet we're omnivores and catching meat uh, and having that as part of our diet was pretty important. So without the right hardware to like catch and kill things, how did we do it? And there's a lot of evidence that suggests that uh, we were able to essentially like run animals down, like exhaust them to the point where they couldn't run anymore and then catch and kill them. And the reason we were able to like out endure, like basically run these animals down that uh, was because we were able to sweat. We could uh, have a high rate of metabolic activity uh, and shed that heat uh, more efficiently than the prey we were chasing, and that's because of the eccrine glands. Um, there are a couple other glands, though they're pretty important. There are the sebaceous glands, which produce sebum, and that's important for waterproofing, keeping that water in our bodies. Uh, and then there were the apocrine glands, and these are basically the glands that make us smelly. Uh, these are used for chemical communication. And some mammals have refined these. Uh, like the skunk has a, like anal apocrine glands that it uses to you know, spray a potent scent that actually uses for chemical defense. Uh, and then the last and maybe, maybe most important are the, the mammary glands where uh, mammals produce milk, and this is certainly one of the most defining characteristics of what a mammal is. You know, all mammals have mammary glands. All right, so those are the, uh, uh, the that's hair and glands. Uh, the next slide we're going to get into is uh, all, about, all about scales and horns and stuff. In the intujament, uh, Mammals have concentrated keratin uh, primarily in a, a couple places. 
um, mostly at the ends of their digits. And um, this keratin has been derived into a variety of unique structures, uh, like claws, uh, in certainly things like felines, uh, retractable claws, uh, the fingernails that you find in primates, and then the hooves that you'd find uh, in ungulates. This is all uh, keratin structures, and I'll provide pretty important fu uh, functions either for like capturing prey, uh, locomotion, or defense. Uh, some mammals have also used this keratin uh, to form a dermal armor. Um, then a pangolin or an armadillo would be a good example of uh, a mammal that's got this keratin uh, developed into tissue uh, that it protects itself with. So um, these are a few more fairly unique structures that you'd find uh, in mammals that have a, a similar anal analogous uh, traits in other organisms, but you know the scales that you might find in a reptile, or the, the claws that you might find in a reptile, uh, the armor that you'd find in a, a fish, a bony fish, uh, those are all derived from different tissues. So in mammals, because it's keratin, uh, they're unique. Uh, circulation and lung ventilation is also derived in mammals, where the mammals have a diaphragm that they use uh, in addition to coastal or rib ventilation uh, to draw air uh, into their lungs. Uh, now, the other important anatomical structure here is the heart, where uh, just like birds, mammals have a four-chambered heart, uh, and again, uh, the mammalian heart evolved independently of the avian heart, uh, even though they're very similar in structure. So, uh, derived traits here would be the diaphragm uh, and the four-chambered heart. We're going to leave uh, derived traits of mammals at this point. Uh, we'll come back to them uh, in class and in the follow-up uh, video lecture. Um, but I think that's enough for now. Let's talk briefly about the major uh, vertebrate groups, uh, sorry, the major mammalian groups. You can break the groups down into three categories. There's the prototherians, which would include basically all the monotremes, so the duckbill platypus and two types of echidna. Then there's the marsupials, uh, and these are things like the kangaroo and the koala, the possum, wombat, bandicoot, Tasmanian devil, and so on. Uh, and then the last group are the placentals. Uh, and that's everything from pangolins, dogs and cats, deers and cows, uh, whales, bats, rodents, lemurs, rabbits, armadillos, elephants, dugongs, and even the aardvark. So those are the three uh, major mammalian groups. In the next couple slides, we'll get into what distinguishes them from each other. Right, so, of the three major groups of mammals, monotremes have to be some of the most unique. Um, first, let's talk about their cloaca. The word monotreme you know, pretty much means uh, that they have a single mono uh, opening for both reproduction and elimination of waste. Uh, and that's unique amongst mammals. Um, Monotremes also lay eggs, which makes them different from all other mammals. Uh, their eggs have very thin, um, like paper thick shell, uh, leathery, much like a, like a reptilian egg, not like a bird egg. Uh, it's a little more complicated than that uh, because they do have somewhat extensive internal gestation. So this is kind of the way it works. You know, the the egg is fertilized internally, uh, and then it spends almost a month, like about 28 days, gestating internally. 
although it's not uh, attached to the like uterine wall or anything like that. It's just developing internally uh, before it gets its shell. Uh, and then it's uh, laid, and then uh, this egg will remain um, outside the body of the animal for about 10 days, where it'll finish gestating before hatching. Um, and most uh, monotremes will have like a little egg tooth to help them break through the shell. Uh, then there's still parental care, however, at this point, and these uh, often altricule young need care and need to be nourished. So the mammary glands come into play here. However, they don't have nipples. They have mammary, gland, mammary glands, but they're not as concentrated as in other mammals. So they basically, the, the, these glands will secrete milk uh, and it will accumulate in on tufts of fur, which the baby monotremes will then you know, lick off. Um, and they will do this for sometimes about four months or so. So uh, that's all pretty unique. Uh, however, monotremes also have um, no teeth, so they've secondarily lost their teeth, it seems, and uh, replaced uh, those mouth parts with either a, like a leathery bill or uh, like a sort of long slender snout. Um, I should also point out <coughs> that uh, monotremes uh, only have uh, one ovary. The other ovary has been reduced. So those are some of the unique characteristics that define monotremes. Next, we have the metatherians, otherwise known as the marsupials. Uh, these creatures uh, are superficially similar to uh, mammals you might be familiar with, um, or they are different in several important ways. We only have one marsupial native to Ontario, and that's the possum. So um, it's okay if you're somewhat unfamiliar with what makes a marsupial a marsupial. Um, where they diverge from the monotremes is that they have separate openings for um, the urogenital sinus and the rectum, uh, which is, I think, a, a positive advancement. Uh, however, internally, female marsupials uh, are different in a very important way. Uh, they have two, in some cases, uh, three vaginas. Uh, the two lateral vaginas uh, are for sperm delivery, uh, and then the middle uh, pseudovagina is for birth. Um, because of this unique internal anatomy, uh, male marsupials often will have a, a bifurcated penis. Um, so it's not, it's not exactly that they have two penises, it's that the glands typically is bifurcated at the end of the penis. Uh, now, the way this plays out um, is important because um, where it's said, where, where uh, marsupials are distinguished from the last group, uh, the placentals, uh, it's often stated that marsupials don't have a placenta. Uh, and that's not strictly speaking true. They they do have a, a simplified placenta. So um, essentially the egg is internally fertilized and uh, it gestates internally for eight to 12 days. Uh, and usually the last couple days, last four, maybe five days that uh, fertilized egg attaches to the uterine wall uh, and while it's there it forms a simple placenta. There is you know, a gas exchange and a nutrient exchange going on there. Um, when the young are eventually born uh, they will crawl under their own power um, 
to a, a, sometimes a pouch, um, but more often than not, they're just crawling their way to find uh, a nipple. Uh, and uh, if it's not in a nipple, sometimes, or sorry, not if it's not in a pouch, sometimes it'll just be like a, a fold of skin. And th these uh, young, very altricule uh, marsupials will nurse for three to four months before they're large enough to um, detach and start foraging for themselves. So that's uh, marsupials, and we'll talk more about uh, marsupials in the fall of lecture and how they're different from placentals. And the last of the mammalian groups are the eutherians. These are the placentals, uh, and this is the group that we fall into, the humans. Uh, so uh, placentals have a much longer gestation period than marsupials. Uh, however, that's typically shorter overall than the time uh, it takes marsupials to wean their young. So um, marsupials actually care for their young longer than placentals do, even though placentals are caring for their young uh, internally. Uh, so once an egg is fertilized, in a placental mammal, this uh, amniotic egg attaches to the uterine wall. Uh, the uh, outer membranes of the egg uh, that envelop the embryo uh, differentiate uh, into a, a new embryonic organ called the placenta. Uh, and this placenta allows for longer internal gestation uh, because it uh, first uh, it acts as a barrier that protects the the unborn uh, fetus from the mother's uh, maternal uh, immune system, but it also facilitates nutrient and gas exchange and uh, is really important for waste removal. So this uh, placenta is really important organ. Uh, gestation. Uh, internal gestation can last for weeks, uh, if not years. Uh, elephants will have internal gestation for up to two years. Once uh, a baby is born, uh, the lactation and parental care period can last for several weeks to, to several years, maybe even you know decades if you consider humans. So uh, that, that's the eutherians. And I think uh, we're going to leave it there. Uh, we're going to pick up this conversation in class, and we're going to explore the diversity of mammals in Ontario through the use of uh, dichotomous key uh, and a, a really beautiful collection of skulls. And uh, we'll use that dichotomous key uh, and some of the anatomical structures that we find uh, in mammal skulls to explore uh, basically what kind of mammals we've got. Uh, there will be assignment associated with this that you'll complete in class and hand in at the end, and that will be uh, part of your participation mark for the day. And then we'll wrap this up. We'll wrap up mammals with a, a short follow-up lecture, video lecture, uh, primarily focusing on the conservation aspect of uh, of mammals. All right, so that's it for now.